Good morning and welcome to the programme. My guest this morning is one of the most influential uh, political strategists we've ever had in this country. He was Director of Elections for Fianna Fáil uh, for the last three successful elections for that party. He was uh, also uh, the Government Press Secretary when Charles Hawhey was in power. He is now um, a lobbyist. Uh, his name is PJ Mara. PJ, good morning to you. Good morning. It's a pleasure to have you on the programme. We come from the same locale. We do. We won the first prize in the lottery of life. We were born in John Condra. <laughs> yes, and you were born a couple of years before me um, in Millmount Avenue, Mill Avenue, which right. anyone who's ever travelled in from the airport just beside uh, St. Pat's. Uh, and you went to school in St. Pat's. I did. I went to school. I started school in St. Pat's in September 1946 after the long teacher strike ended. I think it was a wonderful school. Yes, it was. Uh, in terms of the commitment of the teachers, the way the place was managed by... There were two headmasters, I remember. There was Mr. Gallagher in the number one school, which was for the smart boys. You went to the number two school, by the way, which was for the lesser orders who did their <laughs> subjects through English. Is that on the government's <laughs> intelligence file on me? <laughs> anyway... Uh, along, along with other, <laughs> other stuff. <laughs> no, it was a nice... Uh, it was a, a very good school. It was very... Uh, they were very strong on... Uh, getting uh, their children their, uh, focused, uh, the pupils focused. They maintained a very strong sense of discipline and self-respect. Uh, there was no messing and they you know, went out of there with you know, a sense of yourself and go on to secondary school or whatever. But yes. I, had, uh, I thought they were wonderful people. I had you know, great memories of them and very fond memories of all of them. Yeah, the strap was in vogue uh, then. But that was the way it was in those times. I mean, people go on about like, you know, how cruel the teachers in Ireland were and wherever, uh, the Christian brothers and the Jesuits and the national teachers and the nuns. But I mean... The English public school, you know, they yeah. invented all of this thing, eating, flogging and all that stuff. So, you know, they, I mean, they acquired a habit for it. <laughs> I'm, I'm reliably informed. Anyway, uh, now, your father was a guard. He was. And he died when you were seven, was eight. it eight? He died, he died in February what was his 19, name? Uh, 1950. Uh, John was his name. And y your mother? My mother was Sabina. Yeah. Now, tell me, when your father died, uh, aged eight, um, how big... A shock? Well, you know, in a funny kind of way, you know, I was eight years of age, and uh, when you're that age, a lot of this goes over your head. Mm. You know, there's a lot of drama around the house, and, you know, a lot of people are crying and upset, and your mother is, you know, in bits and whatever else. But, you know, for children, you know, that age, and I've seen it since in other families, you know, that, you know, for young families, that, you know, it, it, the drama, like, and it's, I think it's afterwards, perhaps, that, you know, the thing clicks in, you know, that there's no daddy there, or no mammy there. But when it happens, like, you know, it, um, as I say, it goes a wee bit over your head, and that's my memory of it. But afterwards, of course, it does. Like, there is this gap in your life, and, you know, and so on. Were you an only child? I was. I had one sister, Marion, yeah. Yeah. And were you the eldest? I was the eldest, yeah. Well, time's hard when your father died. Yeah, of course they were. But you know, one of the things about that is that yes, they were hard. And I, you know, but again, you know, children don't notice these things. You know, I, they were hard. I'm, sh I'm sure it was very hard for my mother. You know, uh, who was left a widow, dependent on a, a stage guard of pension. But she was a great manager. You know, she set about uh, setting up a small sewing operation. You know, knitting where she, you know, um, uh, uh, supplementing that yeah. income. And you went on then uh, to be educated in Colossian Square. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Were you a good boy or a messer? I was. I say good sometimes and messers other. You know, another <laughs> other times. You know, uh, I, yeah. I think I was okay. I was an average student. I think I got three honours in my leaving cert or something like that, which wouldn't Pretty good. Get, which wouldn't get you anywhere too far nowadays. You know, with the kind of competition that exists. Now, so, I remember you when I was growing up, PJ. Um, you were, as to say, older than me, and a, quite an imposing figure, always smartly togged out. Yeah. And usually, uh, we were corner boys, me and my gang. We used to stand on the corner. You were always heading somewhere, and sometimes it was to the tennis club. I think that. You were the king of the tennis clubs for a while, right? I, the think, dances. That, I think your memory is playing tricks with you, yeah? <laughs> it's not playing tricks with me. But, yeah, I, well, I'll tell you the thing about that. Where we grew up, uh, the, um, the the social options for you know boy meets girl were you know were limited enough really you know and um, the clubs tennis clubs or football, rugby clubs were the only place. Now the North City, where you and I were, C Y Fairview, uh, at Glass Nevin Tennis Club. 
Charleville. Yes. So, so then when you wanted to go up market for a bit of high class toddy, you had to go south side. <laughs> and which is which is your favourite venue? <laughs> well it was Belvedere on a Sunday night. And then there was um uh, Angus Saturday night and the tennis club there in Ranelagh on a Friday night. So you had a range of options. Yeah, but I, I tell you, the limiting factor in all of this was money. Because you know, you got to, I mean, the money was very scarce in those years. And so you, you, you had to, you, it wasn't all of these things. All of the above, it was one or the other. Like, you know, what was always, the form? I mean, what was it like? It was very, it was kind of sedate, really, wasn't it? You know, my memory of it. Uh, it was pretty much the vulnerable romance, Irish vulnerable romance yeah. thing, like men on one side and... So a few know. jars first? No, you see, maybe later in later years, like after I was 18, I didn't start drinking when I was 18. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and then very moderately, because again, the limiting factor was money. Too bad, yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, when we were in school and that going to tennis clubs, up to 17, uh, there was no jar, just go straight to the dance. And hope that you would um, do the business, like, Click. Uh, which is pretty harmless indeed. Like you know, anyway. The the ultimate ambition being a kiss. Oh, to a kiss. That was it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. And a smooch. Because I know your choice of music will slow dance. later on. Slow dances. Yeah. <laughs> slow dances. Yeah. At the end of the night. Anyway, <laughs> well, I don't know why I'm going holding, down. Ha holding hands and walking home and all that. You know, holding right. hands and laughing. Thinking uh, about the things we used to do. Do you remember that song? I do. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's, uh, speaking of songs, we'll come to your first choice of music in a moment. Were you a ladies' man? Well, I liked ladies. I liked girls all my life. Yeah. I still like them. I still yeah. like women. You know, I prefer women's company to men overwhelmingly. Um, okay. I mean, there are a few exceptions. Why? You I think women. that they're more interesting. I think they're more open. I think they're more honest. And, you know, uh, I think they're more honest, more honourable, they're more straightforward. Uh, the men, they're not as devious as men. They've, you know. Anyway, I, I just prefer them for, all, for, all, for obvious, other obvious reasons as well. <laughs> all right, PJ, now your first musical choice is a beautiful song, um, The Last Rose of Summer. Uh, and the singer is Dermot Troy. Uh, this was recorded in 1958 when we were at our peak. After my father died, um, we, we used to uh, go off down with my mother down to my uncle's place and her brother's and sister's place down in Glan, Nocturard in County Galway. And there was an old, uh, in my brother, my uncle's house, there was an old uh, wind-up um, gramophone and a big collection of those heavy old 78s. And there were loads of these Moore melodies, Moore's melodies, uh, you know, in that collection. And uh, all day long, I used to play these. Uh, yes. th so this is the reason that uh, I asked to hear this. Uh, PJ, Fianna Fáil has mm. been your life. Uh, that's not an unfair statement, is it? It's been um, a huge part of your life. Yeah, I joined Fianna Fáil uh, in the local uh, common in Drunkon, the O'Donovan Ross Common, uh, with uh, my friend Michael Murphy from Walsh Road, whose who's, uh, family and himself were active. So then I kind of strayed into Fianna Fáil. And, How know, old were you when this happened? I, it was about 1963, 62, 63, so I was 20, 20, well, yeah, 20, 21. Right, and, yeah. but your family, your mother was... No, was she my Fall? mother's family would have been Fianna Fáil supporters, they would have taken that side in the, in the, in the Civil War, her brothers and so on. Uh, my father's family were the complete opposite. They, my father had joined the Guards before 1932, before Mr de Valera came to power. Uh, and would have been a, an old common and ways supporter in, in, insofar as the guards were allowed to have political opinions or views but that would have been his background and that would have been they would have been his views so he, when did you first meet charles hawhey i would have met charles hawhey sometime in the mid 60s around the 20 was minister for justice around that time uh, he and george Colley were the fianna fall tds they were and eugene chambers the, yeah. eugene chambers was the other uh, he was the third um, Candidate represented from time to time. And your first um, activity was what? Putting up posters? The, the first big job I got was in the 1965 election, uh, Mr. Lamass's uh, Let, Let Lamass Lead On election. <laughs> and I was given, I was given the, great, the grand title of Assistant Director of Publicity, <laughs> which meant getting on the back of a, a Volkswagen pickup and going out along the Clontarf Road and all the way around Malahide Road, up the Drunkhonda Road, you know, until the dawn, you know, with the, you know, two guys' ladders putting these things up. What were the perks of being a member of Fianna Fáil? Because there were perks, but I know there were. If you were in Fianna Fáil, did you plug into something? No, we didn't. I'm trying to be, uh, what was happening at the time when we, when I joined Fianna Fáil in the, mid, mid, in the early mid-60s was the thing was in a, a kind of was on a cusp of change. And uh, so there were a good few younger people coming in that time. And it was more the, if you like, 
the kind of the crack and the collegiality of the thing. Uh, and we, and like we had kind of moved on from, you know, needing people to get a show. We were able to get our own jobs or whatever, such as they were at the time. Most of the people who joined the organisation at that time would be were genuinely interested in politics and political yes. activity and so on. Did you regard it when you joined it um, as a party that stood for what? Left, right? Uh, I, I think it's it's a very broad church, you know, in Fianna Fáil. And the, the membership reflected that. Uh, and I, I like that, you know, it wasn't, I think this is the problem, you know, that some of the other parties have, particularly Fianna Gael, is that it's not broadly based enough. Uh, what does it stand for, P? I I mean, is it a populist party? It's, uh, I suppose it's, it's left of centre to a degree it is populist. Uh, I think it stands for the um, improvement of uh, society in the broader sense, uh, the improvement of the, of the lives of, of ordinary people. Now, this hasn't always been a perfect attempt, you know. Is it a kind of socialism without the sort of... Uh, the diktats and mantras. I think it would be over. I think Fianna Fáil is probably overwhelmingly left of centre. Yes, and yeah, and there is an overlay, and there is an there would be an element, you know, within that that would be centre centre right. Yes, but presumably it's evolved because now it is associated um, in its modern manifestation very much with big business, with large developers, with uh, builders, and always has been. Uh, I think that a lot of those people who were in the construction industry and you know built up business were people who were very small men, right. uh, you know, small businesses 10, 15, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Well, any of them I know are decent uh, men who run fine. You know them yourself. They're good guys, and they run. And I think there's a bit of a myth about this. I mean, there are other business people who support Fianna Fáil besides the yes. construction industry, the people in the technology business yes. and so, so on, and manufacturing services, financial services, whatever. It would be fair to say, would it not, um, that the sort of meritocrats of the last of this generation, they are attracted to Fianna Fáil because it is it's a facilitator for their kind of. I'm not sure facilitator. I think facilitator has you know connotations I wouldn't necessarily go along well, with. Well, I mean, I, in the sense that Dermot Des Desmond wanted the IFSC up and running and yeah. had this brilliant idea. Yeah. The one who facilitated correct. it politically was yeah. Charles Hoyt, correct? Absolutely correct. And you know, the other government, the uh, the previous government, had an opportunity and they walked away from it. Yes. Yeah. So, true. so there's a there's, there's a can well, there's a can do thing. Right. I think there's less the, oh, the thing with the with Fine Gael, I suspect, and I think it's maybe changing a bit there too, is this thing that professional classes, the lawyers, the sisters and so on, that they tend to dominate that organisation more than our lot, which tends to be, as I say, a broader church. Now, uh, broader front, broader mind. Yes. Broader church, broader mind, whatever. It's our mutual friend, our mutual uh, friend John Batchman. Mm. Yes. Broad, broad of church, broad of mind. Broad, broad in, front, in front and broad, broad behind. behind. Yeah. It's the Wickhamist, isn't it? That's right. Okay. Uh, now we've established our <laughs> literary point of view. We can move on to music. <laughs> music. Oh, yeah, really and your second choice of music is... Don't be cruel yeah. by Elvis. Well, let me tell you about that. Like. When in the in the mid fifties, that weird sound, you know, came out of Radio Luxembourg, and we were having to be used to these are kind of nice sedate you know, music, and maybe Frankie Lane was the <laughs> most dangerous thing that was ever loose. Then this thing arrived, and of course, then it erupted. And I always think that Elvis liberated me anyway, and I you know, so I'd like to play that. Did you have a DA? No, I didn't have a DA. No, I had a big I quiff though. <laughs> Them were the days. For those who don't know, a DA was a duck's ass. It was a form of haircut where at the back of your head, the hairs came in. Isn't that right? That's you right. You combed yeah. it Oh, in. yeah. Well, I was big, a big user of Brill Cream. <laughs> a Brill Cream boy. Brill Cream boy. Okay. Uh, PJ, um, you met uh, your late wife, uh, Breda, a beautiful woman with a uh, formidable character uh, who uh, we all miss uh, very much. Uh, at a wedding. Mm. Uh, was it love at first sight? Yeah, I, I think it was a certainly extreme interest at first sight on my part. I don't think she really noticed me the first day. And then the second opportunity was, after the wedding was in August, and the second opportunity then to make an impression was at a Christmas party in um, the groom's mother's house, that wedding we were at, Paddy Egan's house, in, uh, on North Circle Road. Right. And it was a very nice family evening. Everybody having to do party pieces and all of that. And uh, so then I... You had a party piece? 
I had, well, I think I had one of those Clancy Brothers songs or something like that in those years. That's right. <laughs> anyway. You didn't have the Aaron Sweater, did you? <laughs> no, 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 no. So then, we, I, then she had a, she had a flat on St. Peter's Road in Rivesborough, and I walked her home from Rosta, and then I think we met the next day for next evening for a drink or something like that. And then it went from there, and um, that was it. You, I, while we were talking of Brida, she had a long illness and yeah. died, um, sadly, um, after a long struggle mm. with cancer. Um, the toughest period in your life? Very, very tough. Yeah, but in, in again, in a kind of a way, you know, um, when you're caring for somebody who's ill, like you're, you're fo- more focused on them. It's much tougher on the person, you know, who obviously has the cancer. Uh, and this went on like over a period, like the first bout was in 92. Two, and then there was a second bout in 97 and a third bout in 2002 and then a, a final uh, final one in 2003 which, which killed her uh, and so all of that time conducting a public a very public life with, uh, yeah we were in the middle of it, the, the election campaign in 2002 was in the middle of all that but um, we had great support John our son was a great supporter and you know neighbours and friends and that and a lot of it was, you know, when somebody's got cancer, like, you know, you're going for treatment, and you're coming back, and it's either treatment or rest, and, you know, and, um, but uh, she was battled, really, she was a great battler. And, uh, and, and all through your yeah, life, sure. you'd been great friends, yeah. and um, you got a job. When you were young, yeah. Oh, yeah I'm taking you back work. now. Oh, yeah, yeah, the first job I had was a, a summer job. Uh, in the um, Boland's Mills in um, Rings End. And then I got a job in Allied Textiles, which was a um, fabric and makeup factory owned by Courtauld's in Chapel Izzet. From that business led me to starting my own business then a few years later. And uh, Breed and I started that together. And that, we did that for a good few years. We that sold was a fashion. It was a factory. Yeah, and and Breed had been a model, a part-time model. She had been that, oh. you know, before that. Yeah. And then she and I started that, and then we built that up and we sold it and made money. And then foolishly, I went into the furniture business and proceeded to lose it all. <laughs> we, <laughs> or a lot of it anyway. Did you have ambitions to be a tycoon? No, no, I tell you, I've often said this. One of the things that deflected me ever from, you know, uh, making serious money or being a tycoon or anything like that, or being even being a huge success in business, was I was always deflected my politics. Um, because you did become very close to Charles Hockey yeah. and whenever he, um, after the arms trial, wanted yeah. to go down the country on yeah. what's called the rubber chicken circuit, yeah. oh, well, I know uh, you, were, you went together. Well, I think after the arms trial, uh, there were a number of us, you know, the, you know my, oh, my generation in the Fianna Fáil organisation in the North City and particularly in our own constituency who felt that he hadn't, that he had been treated, treated badly and we decided we'd support him. When you say treated badly, is it that he was the fall guy uh, I, for, a, for there, others? There was a, certainly an element of that. And, you know, to be honest with you, I, um, to this day, I'm not clear what happened then. I don't think many other people are either. Are other and all of the participants are now all dead. Yep. We took a view, a number of us, that we would support him yep. uh, as our deputy. And uh, he was a you know, uh, a good representative and we liked him and we said we should support him and it was kind of instinctive as much as anything else and that's what happened. Then he, he was headed for the wilderness then? He was well into the wilderness at that point, yeah, 1970, like he was gone, you know, out the door, back benches, that was it. And uh, then I started, you know, we talked about it and then this, and would you invite me to come to a function, I forget I think it was in Ballinamore and County Leitrim or somewhere like that. And I went and then we did that and we had a good crack and good chat. Uh, I, I described it travelling the roads of Ireland, heaping calumny on our enemies. <laughs> <laughs> we were legion at that stage. were lots of them anyway. And we were well capable of calumny, let me tell you that. <laughs> anyway, we headed off and then one thing about it, then I became very friendly with him. And as I often said to people, I was a friend of his before I ever worked for him. Yeah. You, know, you know, so uh, I worked with him. And then, you know, things went. Then he came back into the front, Fianna Fáil front bench in 1975. Well, in, in, in Health Minister in 77. So when you set off, when he set off, yeah. uh, he had a strategy in mind, did he? That he would cultivate the grassroots of the party uh, with a view 
to returning from the wilderness. That was, I mean, that was certainly the underlying thing, but it was, it was uns, always unspoken. Yeah. We, we were never vulgar enough, you know, <laughs> whether to each other or pri- privately or probably to admit to that. And it was great fun. I yeah. mean, it was one of the best time periods. We know much about Mr. Hawley, but his sense of humour wicked. is something we don't... Wicked. Yeah, yeah, wicked. And, uh, you know, uh, he was he had a hinterland, you know, which yes. many public representatives do not have. They're obsessed with politics and politics only. He could be righteously funny. And um, he, he was just a, a good travelling companion. We've all had those in our lives. Indeed. You know. And um, he was particularly fond of uh, President Mitterrand. The French uh, yeah, that came later in life. Uh, there was a side, you know, that I, I think that was <laughs> almost a cartoon like thing, like you know, we were on my hero and all that. Like he liked the, the fellow down in Greece, you know, the fellow that went. Uh, uh, you no, know, the other guy, the guy that went off, that ran away with his, with the air stewardess. So yes. you know, <laughs> he thought he was a good guy too. I see him as a tragic figure. If you agree with that uh, description of him, what was the source of his tragedy? Or his oh. his downfall. Is it possible to 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 characterize it? Because no one knew him better than you. I, I, I don't know really. They, like you know, the thing is that there are loads. Of, as I said to people before, there are loads of witnesses for the prosecution. You know, and, yes. I, you know, and I would always be a witness for the defence. You know, in his case, uh, I think that Harry Boland, his um, former partner, summed it up best when he said in that um, Mary McCallaghan's program about him. He achieved an enormous amount, but he probably could have achieved more. I just think that if you, when, I prefer to look at it another way, that when you uh, list his achievements right through from the 50s and and flaws on the other side, I think overwhelmingly it will come out that um, he would be probably the best and most outstanding parliamentarian politician of his time. Okay, and uh, I mean, I think it was T.S. Eliot, or was it? Yeah, Foster, who said that if I had to choose between betraying my country or betraying my friend, I hope I would have the courage to betray my country. Um, so you haven't betrayed uh, your friend. <laughs> now, let me ask you, in a piece Vincent Brown wrote last year, uh, during the election campaign, he wrote very perceptively of your relationship with Charles Hawhey. And he said that had Mr. Hawhey uh, listened to you um, when you were his confidant and his uh, press secretary, um, he would have won more elections and, and achieved what eluded him, uh, the overall majority. Um, there is something in that, isn't there? I, I think that's, that's true. I, I, I prefer to put it another way. Um, I had a, had a view for many years, you know, that we were um, getting a share of the vote, 45, somewhere between 45, 47% of the election. I forget what the numbers are now, but it's around, the, it's certainly in the mid-40s. And it, with those kind of numbers in, a P, in our PR system, you should never lose an election. You have to win if you do it properly. And uh, we, uh, I, I talked to him about this another, on a few occasions, and he had a view, he was very traditional in his ways, he had a view that, to me, that my job was to deal with the press and the government communications and all of that, and he felt that I was good at that, but that I should stay out of the other. So then that was that, and we considered we continued to get these big market shares, 44, 45%, and we continued to lose out on an overall majority, which we should have had quite easily. However, then fast forward then, when I became um, Director of Elections in 95, uh, and I sp- was sp- spoke to our uh, Sean Donnelly, who did all of our market research, or a lot of it, with Des Bourne from Behaviour and Attitudes. And Donnelly was very, he had the same view as I had, only more so. And we had a chat, he and I, one evening with Charlie McCreevy and Chris Wall, from, who was Bertie's um, director of elections in his own constituency, in my house. And then um, Ray McSharry was running the constituencies committee at that time, and I was director of elections, so I was a member of the, of the, of the constituencies committee as well. So I went to that, and we talked about this at great length. And in fairness to Bertie Hearn and to a few people like Brian Cowan and Ray McSharry, Noel Dempsey, a few of them, they backed, you know, what I was saying and what Sean Donnelly and McCreevy and, and we enforced that. And uh, we, I think, with the, in that election, we got the same vote as they got in 92 when we got seven more seats and come back right. into government. And then we've increased the vote now ever since up to about 42%. 
So, yeah, uh, but he, Charlie, had this view that the organization was, you know, paramount and they, their views had to be respected and smart guys like me coming from headquarters shouldn't be imposing ourselves too much into their affairs. And uh, he did pay a price, and the price was that he, was, he got a huge vote, a bigger vote than anybody else ever got, a bigger share of the vote. It didn't translate the way our system works into uh, into a majority. Now, your role as government press secretary yeah. has been uh, will you, will be you have been immortalised by the late Dermot Morgan in Scrap Saturday, um, dealing with the press. Yeah, tell me about journalists. Do you like them? Yeah, I got, overwhelmingly I got on very well with them. I think probably at the end of my time, at the end of whatever twenty years or whatever it was. I think there are only about two, uh, maybe three journalists that I don't have any relationship with at the end of all of that. Yeah, I think, did you say that you used to like them? Have you we wearied of them a little bit? I have. I, th I thought in the last couple of elections, I, I, I thought that there was a kind of a sea change in it. Uh, and one well, thing that struck me about them was that at the press conference, now I didn't deal very much with them because yes. we had a big, yeah. uh, we had press officers and press secretaries and the whole nine yards. But going to the um, press conferences, on the daily press conference we had down the Treasury Building, I just felt that, you know, that some of them are very bad mannered. Yes. You know, I, there's a kind of an aggression, you know, yes. uh, you know, an aggression bordering on insolence, you know, which is unnecessary, you know, to get that kind of business done because it is a two way, you know, it works two ways. I mean, I had, you know, relied on journalists to keep me right. They relied on me to keep them right. And there was that kind of thing that maybe collegiality is too strong a word. It was adversarial, but it was adversarial with certain rules. And I felt those rules had, was, had gone out the window a bit. Uh, one of the uh, most vivid memories of the last election um, was Vincent Brown's yeah. intervention yeah. Uh, when Bertie was holding a press conference. Mm -hmm. I must say, <laughs> were you surprised when Brown stood up? No, I wasn't a bit surprised. We were all kind of anticipating. I wasn't quite sure what form we were You weren't quite sure how to handle him, were you? I've never seen you flummoxed. Actually. Well, I, all I could do, I, you could have, I had a choice. I, you could start a row and turn to roar and shout and take the mic from him and you know, throw him out or whatever else, or you could let him go on. So I decided, look, come on, you know. This, and he was going on about being Muslim in the past. He was never Muslim. I mean, the problem with Brown in the past was he used to dominate press conferences <laughs> to the exclusion of every other unfortunate journalist who was trying to get a line. So I decided the best thing was to let him go on. So it worked out okay in the end. Some people said, oh, you know, Vincent skewered PJ Marvel. Vincent uh, and I know each other too long for that kind of crack. Anyway, Mr. Hall, he used to enjoy Brown. He did, yeah. And the confrontation to a point, Lord Copper, you know. But, yeah, um, <laughs> and the best conference scenario. <laughs> yeah, there was a kind of, a, in the end, like Vincent and himself were very close, uh, you know, when yeah. he was very ill, uh, which is kind of an interesting thing. But I think there was a kind of a, a had certain character uh, yes. defects or whatever, or pluses that. Similarities. Yeah, similarities. That's the word you're looking for. Whatever. <laughs> okay, we're going to take your third uh, choice of music now. And it's uh, you two uh, song, Sunday Bloody Sunday. Tell me. Well, that. I'll tell you why I think about them. I, over the last few years, I have travelled a lot in my work. And no matter where I go in the world, whether it's in South America, Central America, the Caribbean, Central Europe, if anybody thinks that you know anything about you two or you know them, it, 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 they have been fantastic ambassadors for this country. And I, I just think they're outstanding people and I think they should be recognised as such here in this country. That's all. OK. Uh, PJ, um, you exited um, the, the political life um, on a day-to-day -day basis and became a lobbyist. There's well, I tell you, you know, first of all, the lobby, I don't know where this lobby thing came out. I, when I left the government press office, uh, my first client was a GPA. And yes. My job for them was to deal with the... Um, it's the late Tony with, Ryan. With, yeah, the late Tony Ryan and his great, great business, great company, good people was to deal with the financial press here in Dublin and London and New York. And that was really, and to this day, I mean, I was, you know, it's much, my work is as much that as advising people on their relationship with government, local and national, you know. And it started out, you know, as a primarily dealing with the financial press for GPA and then moved on to other companies, to Joe Moran's companies and into other businesses in IFG, IWP, all that. And then on and on and on. And uh, so then it became a mixture and people say, well, you understand how this thing works and we have an issue with government and how do you go about it and so on. And that was, so it was kind of a mixture of the two, yeah. Now, um, 
When you were involved in Pinafall, as you said before, I mean, the reason your businesses wouldn't have flourished was because really politics was always in the forefront of your thoughts and consuming presumably a lot of your energy. Uh, Now, uh, you have been very successful and acquired a lot of money. You've worked for Tony Ryan, uh, Tony O'Reilly, Dennis O'Brien, John Warner, people uh, like that. Um, So you're now very comfortably off. Mm. You live in beautiful, leafy uh, South Dublin. Good. Yeah, it's, you know, it's fine. Uh, I've been lucky, you know what I mean? I believe that, you know, and I believe I've had a guardian angel as well. I do believe that. That's kept me out of trouble or serious trouble. Hey, I wouldn't, I'm not, I'm not mega rich or No, but that. you've got, you've yeah, got yeah. The, what uh, Frank Sinatra called, uh, no, it wasn't <laughs> Frank Sinatra actually. It was Humphrey Bogart. <laughs> you've got the FU money. Yeah. Well, there's that, yeah. But I mean, I'm, I, I, money, I, I, to be honest with you, I was never that terribly interested in money, never that good at making it. Uh, Let me ask you about one difficult p- point in your life, the Flood Tribunal. Oh, yeah. When you had to go there, and mm. you were subsequently largely exonerated. But uh, something, the tribunal things now, mm. the picture that's uh, painted of the world that you were central to, Mm. Um, of Irish politics, public life, mm. uh, and in particular, but not exclusively, the Fianna Fáil party. Um, what do you make of all of that world on reflection now? I mean, well, I'm, talk- I'm thinking about Ray Burke, oh yeah. I'm thinking about Charles Hoy, uh, your predecessor's government press secretary, Frank Dunlop, mm. uh, Liam Lawler, all of these people, and what went on. Yeah. Well, I, well I, 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 all I would say is that... Um, it, it was kind of peripheral, you know, what was going on, you know, throughout the government and throughout the organisation, the parliamentary party. <clears throat> but you've got to remember, Fianna Fáil is made of, I think we, I think the last time I checked, the number recently, 30,000, 35,000 members, you know. And there were uh, people who standards didn't measure up. That's yep. true. You've listed, you only missed maybe half a dozen at the most there. Yeah. I you understand t- that. You talked about the Fianna Fáil that you, you joined. Yeah. And it's allegiance, if you like, mm. to the common mm. man and man or woman with aspirations. Mm. And I, I just wonder how that sort of value system can be reconciled, if you like, with some of the things, because the common man and women were victims of some of this. I understand that, yeah. Can I just make a point to you? Mm. What you say is, is, you know, there's a lot of validity in it, but the point, of the fact of the matter is this, that every political party in uh, with the Western world in recent years has had problems over fundraising, money, something. Mr. Chirac. Mr. Chirac, is, Chirac, is, Mr. Chirac has got 30 mil in Japan. Japan. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, um, the uh, British Labour Party is in turmoil. The Tories were in turmoil. The Republican Party in the United States is in turmoil. And the Democrats have had their problems. You know, the Speaker of the, of the, of the, the House has resigned. Look, this happens in politics from time to time, and it's something that has to be dealt with. You know, the tribunals, the law courts, or whatever else, you know, is, the, um, the various commissions that have been set up by governments over the years to deal with that, let them get on with it. Do you get fed up with journalists? No. And public commentators, and uh, some politicians who are pontificating or moralising about this, and is your answer that, look, this is... This goes with the territory. This happens in every country. It happens. It shouldn't happen. It will happen in the future. You know, no matter what tribunals, no matter what commissions, no matter what process you set up, because it's human nature. Original sin, Eamon. Yes. You know, and you know, people are weak, and people do things they shouldn't do. And if they do them, they, if they're caught, then they have to face the due process. That's my view. Uh, original sin. PJ, it's been, as always, a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much for joining us on the programme this morning. Thank you. That's uh, PJ Mara. Uh, That's all we have time for this morning, folks. We'll see you next week.